we're feeling like it's a good morning. <laughs> we're like, what's so good about it? Um, but uh, Phineas Brzee, founder of the Church of Nazarene, um, he would greet any time of day, he'd tell people good morning. And uh, going off the memory from classes in college, which was a while ago, uh, he would tell anybody good morning because, first of all, if you're a Christian, every, every moment of the day is a beautiful morning where you get to start fresh, where we're born again, we have new life. And also because uh, he was um, excited about what God was doing all over the world, and as Christians, somewhere in the world, there is, there is a Christian waking up to a morning. And so we aren't just in our little corner of Iowa. We are part of a church that's all over the world. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'd like to start off by saying that whoever you are with us watching online or with us this morning, whoever you are and wherever you find yourself in your spiritual journey of faith, know that you are most welcome here to receive God's goodness, His mercy, and His love. I'd like to start off with uh, some verses from Psalm 34 uh, out of the, uh, the, the psalm for today. It says, this is a psalm written by David after he pretended to be crazy before Abimelech, who banished him and he left. And he was praising God that he got out of the situation he was in by pretending he was crazy. Some of us might learn from that. <laughs> some of us might not have to pretend some days. Amen. <laughs> King David writes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. I praise the Lord. Let the suffering listen and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Together, let us lift up his name up high. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to God will shine. Their faces are never ashamed. This suffering person cried out. The Lord listened and saved him from every trouble. On every side, the Lord's messenger protects those who honor God, and he delivers them. Taste and see how good the Lord is. The one who takes refuge in him is truly happy. When the righteous cry out, the Lord listens. Let me say that again. When the righteous cry out, the Lord listens. Amen. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. One of the, the words that stick out to me is there in verse 3. It says to magnify the Lord with me. Now, Growing up, I heard that phrase, magnify the Lord, but it was just a worship word to me. I didn't really understand it. Until later, I, I heard that the, the idea of magnifying the Lord, but when you magnify something, is, is you look at something bigger. You put something up under a microscope, you magnify it. You can take a telescope and look at the stars, it becomes bigger. And so that idea of magnifying God is we need a bigger idea of who God is. We need to remember God is not some small thing that we can control. God is not some small, weak thing that uh, is beat up and can't help us, that can't deliver us. We need to magnify the Lord. We need to lift him up on high. We need to say our God is an awesome God. He is a big God. He will deliver you. Magnify the Lord with me. So let us uh, start off this morning by magnifying the Lord. We're going to be in number 319 if you have the hymnal. 319. If you, if you have a handle here or if you stole one and took it home, it's number 319. Barbara. 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 I'm sorry. Barbara. It's, uh, some of you may know it. I'm not sure if you'll know all the verses, but you'll definitely know the chorus. It's Onward Christian Soldiers Marching as to War. Uh, we're going to be in Revelation 13, and um, it's about the war going on between the church and the beast. And so as Christians, we are at war. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against a supernatural enemy. 
Too often Christians make the people they're arguing with on Facebook or the, the other political candidate or party or whatever their enemy. But as Christians, our enemy is not a person. Our enemy is the evil one. And we, do, we need to remember we are at war. And we have already won. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. 
I'm not the leader. The uh, Pope or anyone else is not the leader. He's the leader. His army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Some are called to be Sunday school teachers. 
Some are thrown into being Sunday school teachers and told learn to swim like they throw in the ocean. Uh, but we all have ways we can serve God. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Well, let's uh, fulfill the, God, the calling God has placed on our lives. So, the only thing I'd like to say um, about, instead of announcements, just say uh, we do have our offering box back there. If you come and want to place your offering in it, it's back there. And if you'd like to uh, mail in an offering, our, our address is Living Love Church the Nazarene, 418 West Summit, Winterset, Iowa, 50273. Now, we are in this for the money. Amen. Uh, as of right now, during this COVID, all of my paycheck as pastor is going right back to the church. I'm not saying that to build myself up. I'm saying it so you guys know. I'm more dedicated to this church than I am to a paycheck. I want to see our church survive this pandemic. Amen. And so everything you give will support our church here. Uh, our electricity bills, uh, everything that we, we have to do to keep going as a church will support us as we support our district and support missions. And yes, yes. And uh, we also, if, you're, if you want to come, uh, we, are, we are practicing social distancing here. We are being safe. Uh, we don't require masks. Uh, if, if the governor decides to say everyone has to wear a mask, we'd have to follow that. But as of now, there's not that mandate. And so uh, we encourage you, you know, if you're comfortable wearing a mask, if you have a health reason not to, we understand that. Um, I have a friend who, I was telling Carrie about this this morning, I have a friend who's bipolar. And when she's going through some of her manic side of things, uh, she can't wear a mask. She freaks out. She goes manic. And so we have to take all these things into consideration. Um, not everybody is the same as us. Everybody has, comes from different backgrounds, has different medical backgrounds and problems, and we need to be uh, considerate of that. So um, we just want you to come, and, and if, you, if you're able, you feel safe, and join us. If not, we understand we're doing our live videos. And even after COVID and everything, we'll still be doing our, our uh, sermon online. Uh, right now, we don't have a, a Christian copyright license, so that's why we're doing hymns that aren't copyrighted. So we're doing some of the older hymns. Uh, but maybe down the road, um, maybe as if we're able to grow as a church and able to uh, purchase a copyright license, we might do that down the road so we can put videos of copyrighted songs online. But uh, that's something down the road. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you for supporting our church. Thank you for watching. If, if you're not able to support this church, we understand. If you have another church you go to that you're supporting, we understand. We're just grateful we're able to uh, worship with you. Because we're part of one church, one body, one Christ. And outside of the church, they say Nazarene, Methodist, Baptist, whatever. We're all part of the family of God. Amen. And we shouldn't allow these little differences to separate us Amen. from pushing forward the cross Amen. the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Well, I gave homework on the church's Facebook page. And it totally slipped my mind because it was a whim that I put it on there as I was doing my research for today's message. I should have told you to do the, uh, mention the homework to you and have you tell Margaret or I could have told Margaret, you know, that I put on there to read Daniel 7. That's homework for the message today. So I'm sorry for just not thinking. That's all right. I, uh, I swear I have with, with my daytime job and everything going on trying to restore our house and everything. I'm having trouble keeping track of everything. I, I write little ooh, I'm in trouble. I write little letters to myself so I remember things. <laughs> a little notepad in myself. Uh, I wrote P yesterday for payroll, but I don't remember what I wrote there. I washed off. Thank you. <laughs> 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 That's right. I'm voice recorder. Yeah, voice recorder. But I gave the homework to read Daniel 7 because it talks about the four beasts. And um, today, in Revelation 13, it also mentions, it mentions two beasts, but the one we're going to look at today really encompasses the four beasts talked about in Daniel 7. So I wanted to read out of there. I gave the, you know, the homework to read about the four beasts in Daniel 7, but really, really importantly, I think, is uh, what Daniel writes after the beasts. 
So he has this horrific image of these four terrible beasts. And then Daniel goes on to write, As I was watching, thrones were raised up, the Ancient One took his seat. His clothes were white like snow, his hair was like a lamb's wool, his throne was made of flame, its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire flowed out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood ready to serve him. The court sat in session. The scrolls were opened. I kept watching. I watched from the moment the horn started bragging. Talking about the horn on the head, the horn uh, on the beast. The horn started bragging until the beast was killed and its body was destroyed, handed over to be burned with fire. Then the authority of the remaining beasts was brought to an end, but they were given an extension among the living for a set time and season. They're already defeated, but we right now are going through end times. Ever since the church started about 2,000 years ago, the church has been saying we're living in the last days. We are in the last days, and the beasts, they have been defeated that they're able to make war against the church for a time. And after that time is up, it says, as I continued to watch this night vision of mine, I suddenly saw one like a human being coming with the heavenly clouds. He came to the Ancient One and was presented before him. Rule, glory, and kingship were given to him. All peoples, nations, and languages will serve him. His rule is an everlasting one. It will never pass away. His kingship is indestructible. Now we can focus on the beasts in Revelation or Daniel 7, or we can focus on our coming king. The king is coming. The Lord is coming back for us one day. And until that day, the beasts, they may throw fits, they may make war against the church, but they are already defeated. No matter how much they pretend that they're not. So let's sing number 325 from Marching to Zion, which is uh, the home we have waiting for us. The kingdom that will be established by the Holy One. Let's do verses 1, 2, and 4.
we, we kind of run into a little trouble when we have a, a preacher who's not a singer and can't read music try to remember how the songs go. But uh, we are marching to Zion. We have a, a heaven waiting for us. We have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, as I said, uh, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 13. And I might take a little longer to get there than I usually do. And that's saying something. Because usually I take a while anyway. Oh, that's right. We're, yes, I, you know, I promise I won't, I won't have you guys out here by two. Gail, I think you're winning that one. So I kind of took some detours on my way to this sermon. We went from Revelation 12, and I was looking at, at the war between Satan and the church, and before I, I started this message, I wanted to lay some groundwork. So first I talked about prevenient grace. And interestingly, the holiness today that recently came out was all about prevenient grace. That was a plan. Uh, they had some good articles in there about prevenient grace. And that's the grace of God at work in a sinner's life, drawing them to repentance. It's God at work in the life of the non-believer. God's prevenient. He's intervening in their lives to prevent eternal separation from God. So I talked about being grace, and I want us to understand, before going into the beast, that God is at work, even when it looks like he isn't. We need to comprehend that. We need to understand that. Because if we just focus on the war, it can really feel overwhelming, can't it? We focus on the battle. We can focus on our part and forget that God is working. God is at work. God has been at work. God is willing that none should perish, but every person should come to repentance. And he is at work in every person's life. And then uh, a couple Sundays ago, from that to uh, talking about abuse, uh, narcs, uh, people being narcissistic or, or people being abusive, and, and dealing with that in our lives. And I wanted to lay that down in preparation for this because I think of abuse and, and working through the pain in our lives as one of the things we need to do to really deal with what the enemy has done. Now that person who's been abusive to us, maybe growing up or at some point in our life, they're being used by the enemy, Right? They're allowing it, and they will stand before God because of it. But really, the enemy is the one behind them who has tricked them, who has manipulated them, who has used them to hurt us. Because there's someone that hates you, and there's someone who loves you. So I wanted to deal with that as, we, as a preparation for this. Then last Sunday, we had our church at the park, and I presented the gospel because I knew there were going to be people there that were unchurched and I wanted to talk about the life that God gives. So I wanted to present the gospel. And then today we're getting around to Revelation 13. Finally. <laughs> um, Revelation can be a very confusing book, right? Yes. Through the years, people have had a lot of guesses about things. I was looking up this week about uh, people that have guessed about when the second coming was going to happen. Uh, William Miller guessed 1844. And uh, when that didn't happen, his followers were uh, sad, and they started their own group, the Advent Movement, in which uh, the Seventh-day Adventists well, uh, came from. Um, there's been... Various dates in 1914, 1918, 1925 that were guessed by the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, Chuck Smith predicted 1981. Edgar C. Weisnant wrote the book 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. I remember seeing that book in Christian books. I, I bet uh, you can get them pretty cheap now. Yeah. Get that book pretty cheap. Uh, throughout history of the church, um, 
There's been discussion about the Antichrist. There's been debates over whether the Antichrist is a person or a spirit opposed to Christ. The uh, early church, many in the early church, saw the Antichrist as the, uh, the spirit of the, the Roman Empire. They saw the Roman Empire as, as embodying the Antichrist, especially Nero and other uh, tyrants in the uh, Caesars, you know, in, in the Roman Empire who had declared war against the church. They saw them as types of Antichrist. Uh, some have thought it was the Pope. Some have said Adolf Hitler. So I've heard people say that Obama was the Antichrist when he got into office. Uh, I've heard some say Bill Gates because uh, they thought he was going to get everyone to put the microchip in their skin or whatever. Uh, and any time anyone was opposed to God and making war against God, there were those in the church who, who said, okay, that, that person has to be the Antichrist. So that's been going on for over a thousand years. Close to that year, people say, hey, there it is, there it is, that's the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist. But uh, many have thought of the Antichrist as more of a spirit uh, that wages war against Christ. And we see that in other books that John has written. Uh, John uh, gave us the Revelation. Uh, he wrote in 1 John 4, Dear friends, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. This is how you know if a spirit comes from God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come as human is from God. And every spirit that doesn't confess Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. You are from God, little children, and you have defeated these people because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen. You've heard those verses, but often uh, people skip over the fact that John was talking about that there were already Antichrists, plural, in the world. And in 1 John 2, he writes, Little children, it is the last hour, just as, you have, just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really part of us. If they had been part of us, they would have stayed with us, but by going out from us, they showed they all are not part of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. And we know the truth because of the anointing from the, evil, from the Holy One. Amen. The Spirit inside, right? Yeah. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it. You know that no lie comes from the truth. He is the truth, right? Who is the liar? Isn't it the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This person is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Everyone who denies the Son does not have the Father, but the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. So, were those people right when they said that those people were the Antichrists? Yes. Yeah, I lied. Because there have been many Antichrists. There's the spirit, the idea, the lies of the Antichrist that has been hounding the church since the beginning. We have been living in the last days since we began. But we have to be careful not to fit Revelation, which is this apocryphal, like Daniel, a prop, you, know, you have to apologize probably to really pick up on apocryphal, but it's a type of literature that was common back then that used a lot of imagery, a lot of symbolism, like Revelation, like Daniel and some other books. Uh, Revelation, which is an apocryphal, beautiful, sweeping story of symbolism and pictures that's not chronological, but just has this sweeping, beautiful story that goes over how Satan is making war 
against God that God will win. Amen? We have in Revelation this beautiful imagery and pictures of God versus Satan and, and Satan persecuting a church and the church fighting back. And we need to be careful that we don't take this, this beautiful sweeping story that was just this story and, and imagery and, and, and so much symbolism to the early church and try to force it, try to squeeze it into our modern, scientific, formulaic, chronological mindsets. The way we think nowadays is not the way they thought back then. If you go through scriptures, you'll see that they often use imagery because they didn't take things so literal. It wasn't a big deal to them that, that uh, someone saw something as this way and someone described it as this way and it all just flowed together. Because you were looking at it from different angles. And they cared more about poetry and symbolism and stories and the beauty and art of things. And but nowadays we're so scientific and we, we have our formulas and our mindsets and our literal and uh, chronological, we like our timelines and our boxes to put things in. That, that so many Christians have tried to take the imagery and the beauty of Revelation and force it into our scientific mindsets. And it, it doesn't work that well. Like, take uh, dispensationalism. That's the, uh, you know, the idea behind, you know, the Left Behind series and, and those ideas of premillennialism that, that came from um, this, this little girl who uh, was praying and, and thought she understood uh, Revelation to describe a rapture and all this stuff. And, and that happened overseas and it caught on and, and uh, came over here. And, but if you look at dispensationalism, premillennialism, um, with the premillennialism, premillennialism, try saying that one time. Um, yeah, preacher, get your poster. You all familiar with that. It's one of the things they all debate about. I don't know. I don't know. Was that? Just be ready. Just be ready. People get ready. Jesus is coming. But it's interesting to me that if you look into dispensationalism, uh, we believe that Jesus is coming. It's one of our beliefs in our, our list of beliefs in our manual. We believe in the second coming of Christ, that he will be coming back one day. It's clear in the scripture. But in dispensationalism, they have to believe in basically three second comings. Because he had the first, second coming, when the rapture happens. Then he has some bad news. Then he had the second, second coming, when Jesus comes and, and starts the millennium. That's it, right? The millennium on earth. So that's the second, second coming. And then there's another war, and, and then we have some bad years. Then you have a third, second coming, when God finally fixes it all. And so you have all these second comings. Um, it's it's really confusing. And so, um, I'm not going to get up here, I'm not going to preach the rapture, I'm not going to preach this sensationalism, because that's way too confusing, and way too scientific, and way too formulas, that I don't really feel that it fits within Revelation, which is such a beautiful, symbolic story, that trying to fit it into a timeline, into so many days and months, and it takes away the beauty, we're missing the point of what John was trying to say, and what, what God was trying to tell that early church who was being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Hold on. You will suffer for a time, but the Lord is coming again. Be ready. You never know when the Lord's going to show up. And now that I've offended 20 million people, um, Looking at Revelation 13, we have two beasts. Today, I'd like to look at the first one. Starting actually with uh, 12, 18. It says, Then the dragon stood on the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. Each of its horns was decorated with a royal crown. And on its heads were blasphemous names. The beast I saw was like a leopard, 
Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. If you read Daniel 7, you would, you would recognize that, because each of the four beasts were, you know, they were described that way. The dragon gave it his power, his throne, his great authority. One of its heads appeared to have been slain and killed, but his deadly wound was healed. So the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon because it had given the beast his authority. They worshipped the beast and said, who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? The beast was given a mouth that spoke boastful and blasphemous things. And it was given authority to act for 42 months. It opened its mouth to speak blasphemies against God. It blasphemed God's name and his dwelling place. That is, those who dwell in heaven. It was, allowed, it was also allowed to make war on the saints. You see, we're still on earth. We weren't taken up. Uh, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to gain victory over them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All who live on earth worshipped it. All whose names hadn't been written down from the time the earth was made in the scroll of life of the land who was slain. Whoever has ears must listen. If any are to be taken captive, then into captivity they will go. If any are to be killed by the sword, then by the sword they will be killed. This calls for endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Now there's a lot to go through right there. And I won't hit everything, because there's just so much to take in. But I'd like to touch on a couple of things. First thing, we see the dragon. He's on the seashore. And um, so on the seashore, he's got the sea. And kind of the imagery we see here is the sea with the, the dragon, who is the serpent from the Garden of Eden. And some of us might say, you know, well, no, that was a snake. Snakes don't have feet. Well, remember, part of the curse was that they would have to go on their stomach from then on. So before the curse, they had feet. They were dragons. That's why Satan is described as a dragon. So the dragon had his front feet, in a way, in, in the sea. And he had his back legs on the earth. And you see the sea, the, the first beast comes up out of the sea. And the second beast we'll get to next time, in the, in the second part of this chapter, comes out of the earth. And so you see the enemy, he's bringing evil out of both places. His weapons against us are many, but they will not they will not prevail. They will not prosper. They will not win. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. You see the beast that says he came up out of the water. What's the symbolism of that? I'm going to give you some ideas. I did a lot of studying. I, I read uh, some of these ideas come from the New Deacon Bible Commentary that I got a while back and some other resources. So uh, I want to make sure that when I get up here and I preach on something, I, I study a lot. So I saw a beam that showed an iceberg. You have like this little bit above the water. You have all this below the water. And it said preparation for the sermon is all this under the water, and the sermon is this little bit up top. And I can say as a pastor, that's true. Uh, as a pastor, we've spent a lot of time researching and studying and, and praying and, and uh, really looking into it. So, a shout out to the books I've studied and the writers of those books in prep for this. So some of this, uh, not too plagiarized or steal from those things. Um, I don't want to be a thief. I don't want to steal and, and say this is my idea, so a lot of it comes from there. So, that's my disclaimer, so I can't be sued. Hmm. Hopefully not. Fingers crossed. Uh, it says the beast comes out of the water. What's, what's some of the symbolism of that? Well, uh, ancient myth saw the sea as representing primeval chaos. 
You know, a lot of the, the nations back then, they, they lived around the sea, and a lot of their trade came from the sea. The ships sailed in. And a lot of ships were lost at sea. There's a lot of stories of beasts in the sea. Uh, long before people spread rumors about the Bermuda Triangle and giant squids bringing down ships and all those things, um, you know, that there were tales back then of, of Leviathans and things in the sea. And they saw the sea as this evil, primeval chaos. The Egyptian pharaoh was described as the great dragon of the waters to try to instill fear in the people. And um, in Revelation 20, it says the sea gives up its dead. And in Revelation 21, it says that the seas cease to exist. Well, you know, we're probably on the new earth. There'll probably still be water. So why did the sea cease to exist? Most likely, it's symbolic of the evil of the sea. Their idea of the ancient myth of the sea, there's evil in there. Then they saw it as deep. They didn't know how deep the oceans went, the seas went, you know? They didn't have the science we do today. They saw it as this, you know, a lot of them thought it as a gateway to, to hell or Hades or, you know, the, the, the land of the dead, you know? And, and so um, it was something to be feared. And so one day, God will defeat that evil. And that meant something to the early church. They did not have to fear. Even Paul was shipwrecked, and he survived. And uh, we need not fear what the enemy can do. The enemy may come out of that chaos, that evil of the sea, and he may make war against the saints, against the church, but he will not win. Amen. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. We see the beast here. And it is an embodiment of all the four beasts in Daniel 7. And, and it, it wraps up those beasts into one nutshell, one embodiment of it. And it serves the dragon, and it has the dragon's power, but it tries to resemble the lamb in how it's described, its physical appearance, and in its power. He recovered from a fatal wound. Just like Jesus died and came back to life. The, the beast had a fatal wound and it, it, it should have died, but it didn't. And then it misdirected the worship from God to the, to the dragon. Anything that misdirects our worship from God is not of God. And it says he's able to rule for 42 months. Well, is that an exact 42 months? I don't think so. Because 42 months, a lot of this uh, numbers and stuff in the Bible are symbolic. Uh, 42 months uh, is used elsewhere in Scripture, a lot in the Old Testament and in the, the writings that John uses as inspiration and God uses to, as inspiration here to symbolize a time that God has appointed. It had this idea that, you know, things are going to happen for a while, but God has an appointed a time for that to end. Don't give up. This won't last forever. The enemy may rant and rave and throw a fit and make war against God's people, but that's only for a set time. And it may feel at times like the enemy is winning, like, People that worship the enemy, even if they don't realize they're worshiping the enemy, they're worshiping something that's not God, so they're worshiping the enemy. They will have their day for a while, but in the end, judgment. There's a way that seems right to a man or a woman, but in the end, it leads to destruction. The beast we see is similar to the dragon. Talks about his head, uh, his head and his crown, or horns. And if you look at 12.3, it says, Then another sign appeared in heaven. It was a great fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven royal crowns on his head. 
So he had seven heads and ten horns. The bee says ten heads and seven horns, right? Lost my place. Uh, but anyway, but it's linked to the dragon. And it's similar to the beast from Daniel 7. And if you read it in Daniel 7, if you go back and read it again or look at it again or whatever, you'll see that each of those beasts represented an empire. They represented a tyrant. Um, they represented Ebenezer. They represented, you know, Persia and uh, the Greek, you know, Alexander the Great, that empire, and then the Roman Empire. And so they represented these forces that were going to make war against God and crush the people of God. Well, Jesus came. You know, those beasts, they made war against Israel. They made war against the Jews. Well, Jesus came. We're under a new covenant. We're a new church. We're a new Israel. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. John comes along and says, nope. There's still beasts in the world. There are still those who are going to make war against God's people. Don't give up. The combinations of the heads and the horns and the crowns represent a, a comprehensive onslaught of the church by a power that seeks to usurp God's authority. Uh, I'm trying to not go over everything, I'm trying to get you all some imagery out of this passage without going over everything. Because like I said, I have to be done by two. And uh, so I'd like to finish it for, for too long. Oh my goodness, I have a beauty. No, just uh, <laughs> But um, I'll go over some of, the, some of what's in this passage, get an idea of what it's talking about. And I really think that the combination of the heads, the horns, the crowns, uh, it really kind of sums up since the beginning of the church, this onslaught of a power, by a power that seeks to overthrow, that seeks to usurp God's authority. There have been powers, there have been kingdoms, there have been thrones of mankind that have sought to usurp God's authority. Right? Did they win? Are they still standing today? You know, all those Kingdoms that rose up against God, that made war against God, they're God won. It may have seemed like a while, but in the end, God won. You had uh, Germany making war against the rest of the world. And much of the world uh, thinking, oh, there's no way we're going to stand up to this. But in the end, they won. At time, for a season, for the 42 months, for a season, it may seem like the enemy is winning. There's a, a Southern Gospel song that says, It did not come to stay, it came to pass. This too shall pass. It said, Each head had a blasphemous name. Now, uh, some imagery there that would have meant something to them back then is. They would have likely thought about how um, in Egypt, all the pharaohs considered themselves divine. And in the Roman Empire, when one of the Caesar's rulers died, they would consider themselves divine. And so that was blasphemy against God. They took on a blasphemous name because they would say God's not divine. Caesar is divine. Pharaoh is divine. And ever since then, you've had people in power who've tried to make names for themselves, who've tried to lift themselves up, which is a blasphemy against the one true God. Now we can either, either blaspheme God's name by making a great name for us, or we can lift up God's name. You can't do both. The beast was leopard, bear, and lion rolled into one. So not just really the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire was described by the last of the beasts in Daniel 7. But here it's all of them combined. So not just the Roman Empire, but all that is anti-God, all the anti-God forces throughout church history. 
And I thought it was a lie. He had, uh, one of the heads had a fatal wound that was healed. Uh, early church many thought it referred to Nero, who committed suicide in AD 68, and many expected to return, because they thought, they thought he was a crazy guy, lowercase g as we can say. He, he was, you know, a Caesar, he was Nero, he was divine. And he killed himself, and a lot of the rumors people believed he was going to come back. And he was going to, you know, get everyone back and kill himself because he got, got kicked out. Everybody got tired of how crazy the dude was. And so uh, they thought that with these Caesars, with these rulers being divine, that even though they were dead, they could come back at any time. Now, it could refer to that. But I really think in keeping with the symbolism of Revelation, the healed wound represents the resilience of evil that is defeated but continues to make war against heaven. God keeps winning. Satan keeps getting defeated, but he keeps coming back. He keeps making war against God and war against the church. God's won. But the enemy keeps trying to win some ground back. And it's up to the church to not let him have ultimate victory. We see two questions that the worshipers of the dragon asked. They said, who is like the beast? Now that's an evil twist on the Old Testament phrase that we see a lot in the Old Testament. Who is like our God? That would, uh, would have been a well-known phrase to the early church. Who is like our God? And so for the worshipers of the, the dragon say, who is like the beast, they saw that as an evil twist on a worship phrase for God. And they said, who can fight against it? You know, the dragon is defeated, but the dragon is also a great liar, a great deceiver. And he can make even the saints feel hopeless. Have you ever felt hopeless? Have you ever felt like there was no way? How am I going to get through this? That, that's pretty good for a, a defeated enemy to trick us like that, isn't it? He's defeated, but he's a good liar. Verse 7. The beast was allowed to make war on the saints and gain victory over them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. The, the beast is allowed to make war against the church, and he's able to kill the saints, gain victory over them. And uh, it really kind of brings back to mind the two witnesses we talked about earlier in a previous sermon. The two witnesses who died. But what happened? They came back to life. And we may get defeated for a time, but we have a new name written down in glory. We have a home waiting for us on the other side. We're marching to Zion. There's something better than me. Since the beginning of the church, the church has been abused, has been tortured, it's been martyred throughout history. But it will not last. The end of verse 10 says, This calls for endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Now there's a lot I could go over, and I, I don't want to take the time to go over it. Uh, we just don't have enough time to hit it all there in that section. We have an enemy who has been war against the church. Any who does not, any who do not have their names written on the Lamb's book of life are on the side of the enemy. And if we are to be taken captive, then in captivity we will go. If we are to be killed by the sword, then by the sword we will be killed. If it serves the kingdom of God for me to be gone, for me to go into captivity, then so be it. If it serves the kingdom of God for me to be killed by the sword, then so be it. Because we march forth for a kingdom that is greater and better than us. This calls for endurance and faithfulness on the part of saints. Being a Christian doesn't protect us from trials and tribulations. We have enemies. 
We have people that Satan is using to try to destroy us, to try to destroy the church. I've seen Satan use power struggles in churches to destroy churches. And these were people that thought they loved God and, and tried to serve God, but they had allowed themselves to care more about power and the kingdom. And that's easy to do when we lose sight of what's most important. Right? We have enemies. But the big idea for today is that we have been called by God to, to endurance and faithfulness. When the enemy attacks, endure. Stand faithful. Remember that it may look like he's winning, but he will not win. It may feel like he's uh, like he's won. He's a good liar. He's a great deceiver. Endure. Remain faithful. Stand fast. He will not win. And we need to stick with the one who's all we want. God the Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. There was a lot to cover today, and I know a lot of it uh, I just skimmed over, but I pray that you'll use what we looked at to, to speak to us about enduring and seeing faithful and not giving up in the midst of trials and tribulation and persecution and people who hate on us and who attack us. Help us, Lord, to stand strong and not give up, but to endure and be faithful and, and just focus on you instead on the problem. I always think of Peter and how he walked on the water until he focused on the wave that was coming in. Help us, Lord, not to focus on the size of the wave, but on the size of our God. Help us, Lord, to magnify you, to lift up your name on high. Ask the name of Jesus.